So, das, das haben wir wirklich schon, das haben, das haben wir, na, wir waren da noch nie da unten. Of course, when constructing the whole thing, uh, we several times thought, what if the whole thing just does not work? No, I really believe now this will work, but the next thing is, will we ever find something? So maybe we will just find nothing new. It would be a catastrophe for physics. Yeah? We, we, we would somehow, none of the open questions which we have at the moment would have been answered. So the LHC is basically the most fundamental of experiments. It's like what any child would design as an experiment. You take two things and you smash them together. And you get a lot of stuff that comes out of that collision and you try to understand that stuff. Now, in this case, what we're smashing together is tiny protons, which are inside the center of every atom. And in order to get them going as fast as possible, we have to build this huge 17-mile ring. And we run those protons around the ring multiple times to build up speed, almost to the speed of light. And then we collide two beams going in opposite directions at four points. And at those four points are four different experiments. Atlas, LHCb, CMS, and Elise. Now I work on the Atlas experiment. An Atlas is like a huge seven-story camera that takes a snapshot of every single collision. And that's billions of collisions. And the hope is, is that we'll see the very famous Higgs particle. But every time we've turned on a new accelerator at a higher energy, we've always been surprised. So the real hope is that we'll see the Higgs, but that there's also something amazingly new. You can liken it to when we put a man on the moon. It's that level of collaborative effort. I would say it even bigger than that. This is closer to something like human beings building the pyramids. Why did they do it? Why are we doing it? We actually have two answers. One answer is what we tell people, and the other answer is the truth. <laughs> I'll tell you both. And there's nothing incorrect about the first answer. It's just it doesn't, it's not the thing that drives us. It's not how we think about it. But it's something you can say quickly, and the person you're talking to won't, you know, get diverted or pass out or, or pick up the Sky Mall catalog if you happen to be next to them on an airplane. Answer number one, we are reproducing the uh, physics, the conditions, Uh, just after the Big Bang. We're doing it in this collider and we're reproducing that so we can see what it was like when the universe just started. This is what we tell people. Okay, answer two. We are trying to understand the basic laws of nature. Um, it sounds slightly more mild, but this is really where we are and what we're trying to do. We study particles because just after the Big Bang, all there was was particles. And they carry the information about how our universe started and how it got to be the way it is and its future. At the beginning of the 1900s, it became clear that all known matter, everything that we know about, is made of atoms. And that atoms are made of just three particles, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. In the 30s, other particles were discovered. And by the 1960s, there were hundreds of new particles with a new particle discovered every week. And there was mass confusion. Until a number of theorists realized that there was a simple mathematical structure that explained all of this. That most of these particles were made of the same three little bits we call quarks and that there are only a handful of truly fundamental particles which all fit together in a nice neat pattern. And there was born the standard model. Eventually, all the particles in the theory were discovered, except one, the Higgs. And the Higgs is unlike any other particle. It's the linchpin of the standard model. Its theory was written down in the 1960s by Peter Higgs and a number of other theorists. We believe it is the crucial piece responsible for holding matter together. It is connected to a field which fills all of space 
and which gives particles like the electron mass and allowed them to get caught in atoms and thus is responsible for the creation of atoms, molecules, planets and people. Without the Higgs, life as we know it wouldn't exist. But to prove that it's true, we have to smash particles together at high enough energy to disturb the field and create a Higgs particle. If the Higgs exists, the LHC is the machine that will discover it. Let's assume you're successful and everything comes out okay. Sure. What do we gain from it? What's the economic return? How do you justify all this? By the way, I am an economist. I, I don't hold it against you. Um, the question by an economist uh, was, uh, what is the financial gain of running an experiment like this and the discoveries that we will make in this experiment? And it's a very, very simple answer. I have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea. When, when radio waves were discovered, they weren't called radio waves because there were no radios. They were discovered as some sort of radiation. Basic science for big breakthroughs needs to occur at a level where you are not asking what is the economic gain, you are asking what do we not know and where can we make progress. So what is the LHC good for? Could be nothing other than just understanding everything. The first time I ever saw Atlas was in 2005. I had come out just to see what Atlas would look like because there was a possibility that I could be working on it as a postdoc. I can remember walking in and just being like, you know, just stunned. I mean, me stunned, you know, just, you know, already kind of having an idea of the magnitude. You know, people tell you, oh, it's, it's five stories tall. And you go, oh, okay, five stories tall. And then you see five stories completely filled with microelectronics. All custom designed, all hand soldered. You know, it's like as if it's a five story Swiss watch. 